Thank you all for joining our webinar on LC free phenomics and metabolomics and beyond using MRMS Accelerate. My name is Nancy Wright Ross and I will be your host. If you should have any technical difficulties during the presentation, please use your chat box to communicate them with me. At the end of this presentation, we will have time for a brief question and answer session. We ask that you use the Q&A box during this time and select all participants so that everyone can see the questions being asked. If we are unable to get to your questions during this time frame, we can contact the speaker offline. I would now like to introduce our presenter for this webinar, Dr. Chris Thompson. Chris Thompson is a Global Business Development Manager at Bruker Deltonics for MRMS Solutions. He received his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, working on spectroscopy and dynamics of gas phase ions. Initially a hardware R&D scientist, his research then focused on developing new analytical workflows and applications for magnetic renaissance mass spectrometry, traditionally known as Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance. His current role includes management of customer collaborations, implementation of overall business strategy for various markets and interfacing with internal departments to ensure customer needs are met. At this time, I will pass the presentation over to our presenter, Dr. Thompson. Okay, thank you very much, Nancy. So as Nancy said, uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about LC free phenomics, uh, metabolomics, uh, and, and much, much more than that. Okay, big problems need powerful solutions. Um, as biobanks and clinics open their doors to the promise of, of meta metabolic phenotyping for understanding population health, uh, powerful analytical solutions capable of large-scale deployment are needed. Chemical complexity of clinical samples is traditionally measured by mass spectrometry together with GC or LC. While powerful, the performance of these approaches is dependent upon the time invested in the LC separation. Uh, this limits the sample throughput and narrows the metabolite coverage to only those species chemically visible to the LC method used. So in this presentation today, uh, I'll address the challenges faced in high throughput analysis and will present a new LC free approach uh, for any type of complex mixture. So the global metabolomics market is large. Um, you know, it's greater than 100 million US dollars. Uh, and the field's focus is primarily research-based academic groups, um, you know, not a lot of industry. However, there is growing interest in the pharmaceutical fields uh, as well as clinical facilities. Uh, the community is very active with the annual conference having nearly 1,000 participants this year uh, and also over years past. Uh, and additionally, uh, there are more and more publications each and every year. Uh, with this year having about 13,000 journal articles that focus on the role of mass spectrometry and its role in metabolic studies. However, it's gonna go beyond traditional metabolomics. Um, you know, this solution can really be applied to phenomics or lipidomics, fluxomics, exposomics, foodomics, you know, looking at wines or whiskeys or champagnes, uh, all the way down to the grapes that they're grown from petroleumics, NOM, DOM, environmental samples, uh, and then even looking down the road, you know, hopefully getting into spatial metabolomics. Uh, so really, you know, the market is huge, uh, but it actually can extend to many, many different things. Uh, so here at Bruker, we really are an established provider, a solutions provider for this field. Uh, so if we think about the traditional LCMS approach, uh, Bruker provides a complete solution. So we provide the hardware solution. Uh, we have our own complete data analysis package using Metaboscape, uh, and that has over 100 installations globally right now. Uh, we also have collaborations with top researchers. Uh, you can see just a few of the KOLs listed over here on the right, Professor Sumner, Professor Suzdak, Professor Lee, Professor Dorenstein. Um, all use Bruker's solutions uh, in the traditional sense of LCMS. Uh, and what it boils down to is this is really a, a workhorse type of solution. That solution is shown here. It really extends from the beginning, hardware, 
Uh, this is our Lute HPLC uh, combined with the Impact 2 TOF uh, for our hardware solution. That is in combination with our software, Metaboscape 4.0 and TASK. Um, it allows us to do screening, quantitation, both of those. Uh, and we also provide a lot of content. Uh, we provide the, the Bruker HMDB libraries, uh, the Metabobase personal library, and the Metabobase plant library. And again, you don't really have to take my word for this. Uh, you can see down here in the quote from the Scripps Center, uh, where really the impact to QTOF instrument is, is the workhorse in the lab. Um, you know, that's what this solution is. And, and Bruker's really uh, likes to listen to the community, uh, and, and we listen to the needs and problems that people face. Uh, and that's how we really come up with our new solutions that we'll present here today, uh, you know, really based on the direct needs of people out in the fields. So what we can do uh, is, is we can start with a specific example. So in this case, uh, here's a slide from the group in Germany, Professor Mueller, doing traditional metabolomics. Uh, and this is really a metabolome mining approach. And what we do is we do the LCMS profiles of a wild type bacteria uh, and its mutants. And in this case, you can see we run a 20 minute LCMS run uh, on the QTOF. We run those in replicate analysis. We do that for the wild type. Uh, we do that for the mutants. Uh, and then within Metaboscape, we can statistically separate those. So we have the scores and loadings plots. Um, and then if we look at that, you can see one of the most distinguishing features is this little peak at 506. And so that was supposed to be a novel metabolite. Um, and then what we can do is following the same approach uh, is, is look at the mass spectrum. And you can actually see the peak was easily separated statistically, but within the LCMS run was actually really minor constitute. Uh, so you can see in, in the circle area there, it, it was, was really a, a low intense peak. However, easily separated out statistically. Um, you can see it's a two plus peak at 506.2708. From that, we can then do Smart Formula 3D. So we can do MSMS, where we have accurate mass. We have the isotope pattern. We have MSMS. And through all of this workflow, we're able to get to the molecular formula, which you can see here. To ID a novel metabolite, we also have to get its structure. So what we can do at the same time is run the complementary NMR experiment, do all of those experiments, get the structure. And in the end, this minor peak in the LC run, uh, we, they discovered a novel metabolite. And you can see down here, uh, this work was published back in 2012. But the workflow you just saw was very time consuming, right? And we know there's a new demand out there. The demand's high throughput, right? And so each LCMSMS run, or each LCMS run, it takes 20 minutes. And then you have to run replicate analysis. And what this does is this greatly limits the number of samples that can be run in a given day. And so with the demand of high throughput, what we want to do is we want to see how we can reevaluate this workflow. Um, and really what we want to do is look at the possibility of eliminating certain things, right? And so if we see here, we eliminate specialty chemicals. We eliminate the LC, consumables, solvents. We want to eliminate time and energy. And in doing so, hopefully what we can do is save lots of money. So it's actually sort of a hidden benefit. We go to high throughput, and then at the same time, um, we're going to save money because we eliminate all of the things that you see here. So a different approach. How can we go LC free? Right? LC separation simplifies the chemical space that the mass spec has to handle, you know, amongst other things. You know, but if we want to boil it down, um, we can use low resolution mass spectrometers because the LC simplifies things. So if we want to go LC free, what are two of the main questions that we have to ask? Um, what if the mass spec could handle the complexity without the LCs first? You know, what's the limiting factor? The hint is it's really the mass spec. Um, and is anybody doing something similar? You know, we may need to look beyond our field of focus, in this case, metabolomics or phenomics, uh, and kind of break tradition, right? So 
uh, we'll try to look at the mass spec and then we'll try to break tradition. So most modern mass spectrometers have very similar front ends. Um, you know, there's not much difference vendor to vendor or instrument to instrument. Uh, what really distinguishes them from each other is how the ions are detected, right? So low resolution mass spectrometers use things like electron multipliers. As you increase in resolution on the mass spec side, you'd move to say micro channel plates. Uh, then you could move to electrostatic fields. Uh, and in the end, what we use with MRMS is a magnetic field. And using a magnetic field is a really what provides extreme resolution for the mass spectrometer. So if we look to the right, we're at say 50,000 resolving power, we see just a single peak. As we increase the resolving power of our mass spec, that peak doesn't just get narrower. It gets narrower, but it also reveals more information. So that one peak at low resolution becomes five peaks at high resolution. And what that's doing is giving you information. The lack of information at low resolution is revealed when you go to high resolution and you see these peaks. And these peaks are called isotopic fine structure, right? They're the heavy, heavy elements of the elements in the monoisotopic peak. So you measure your monoisotopic peak, it has its elements. You look to the heavy isotopes of those elements and that's isotopic fine structure. By revealing this isotopic fine structure, we can actually read the molecular formula right off the mass spectrum. So we don't need to do MSMS. We don't need to do database searching. What we can really do is, is read the fine structure and get the molecular formula. So this extreme resolving power gives us two benefits. One, isotopic fine structure, when we can observe it, gives us the molecular formula directly. We read it right off the mass spectrum. It also allows us to look at highly complex samples without LC separation because we have this extreme resolution. In the past, you would have one peak, and this simple example it goes to five peaks. That one peak could then become 20 or 30 peaks. It doesn't really matter for MRMS because we have this magnetic field where we can detect ions under extreme resolution conditions. So what we should do now then is kind of look at our second question and look outside of the field of metabolomics. And where we're going to look is to the field of petroleumics, uh, which is the study of crude oils and their components. Um, and really what we can do is think of petroleumics as metabolomics of the Stone Age, uh, because they're very similar. And you can kind of think of petroleumics as ancient metabolites. What this also does is gives us a worst case scenario, because if we think of clinical samples of plasma or urine analysis, where those are complex samples, they're not nearly as complex as petroleum. It, it, again, it's really just the worst case scenario. It's the most complex sample that you can measure. Uh, and there's been established workflows for direct infusion, MRMS, solving real problems in petroleumics. Uh, this example wasn't just cherry picked to, to highlight that it works. Uh, it was chosen on purpose to show that it solves real problems. So this LC free workflow in the petroleumics industry is used to solve real problems such as corrosion, catalyst poisoning and hydroprocess optimization. Um, corrosion, you can correlate TAN, the total acid number, which was a classical bulk property, now with specific molecules such as neptinic acids to eliminate corrosion effects. Catalyst poisoning, we can characterize sulfur-containing compounds to predict poisoning effects. In hydroprocessing, we can select the best catalyst for cracking based on the characterization results, which is the fingerprinting of the petroleumics, which is just what we're going to do when we fingerprint metabolomics. Uh, and to harken back to the comparison to LC or GC separation, classically in petroleumics, GC separations, in this case here you see, uh, takes 60 minutes. And what it's going to do, it's going to ID you know, 100 to 200 compounds in that sample. And that was the benchmark for years. A single MRMS mass spectrum of an oil sample may take two minutes, may take three minutes, much, much quicker than an hour, but gives you much, much more information. It's going to give you 5,000, 10,000, you know, maybe even 20,000 IDs in a single mass spectrum. Um, and then, so it's that complexity of that fingerprint gives you the uniqueness of that sample and really allows you to solve uh, many of these real world problems. So. We have the technology and we have the examples of complex mixture analysis. Uh, are people using this for the field of metabolomics? And the answer is yes. 
Um, this LC free workflow has been pioneered by a bunch of people going back almost 14 years now. Uh, so back in 2005, Professor Schmidt Kaplin uh, had a 12 Tesla MRMS system, uh, and they really pioneered a lot of this work with NOM, DOM, invertebrates, food and wine, again, looking at whiskeys or wine grapes or champagne, um, origins of all of that stuff, to clinical samples, and even the extraterrestrial where they looked at moon dust and meteoroids, um, really all by LC-free MRMS analysis. Um, from there, I went to Japan. Uh, really interesting examples where these guys were plant biologists and not mass spectrometrists. Uh, and they used isotopic fine structure. You used that within their workflows to discover new metabolites. Uh, and they've been doing really nice work there ever since. Uh, and since then, it's really started to grow across the globe. You know, it's gone through Europe. Uh, it's, you know, gaining popularity in the United States right now. You know, we we just seen it growing, you know, and so, you know, the question is, is where is this going to go next year? And here's the answer. We actually have a sneak preview for you. Um, it's going to be Professor Jeremy Nicholson. So Professor Nicholson was the founding director of the world's first phenome center at Imperial College in London, the National Phenome Center. Uh, and from there, his methods have spread across the globe via the International Phenome Center Network. Uh, the International Phenome Center Network is a research consortium of leading universities and research organizations across the globe, are really dedicated to spreading best practices that have been learned at the National Phenome Center across the globe. So a, a really big network doing great work. Uh, so starting in 2019, Professor Nicholson will move to Murdoch University in Perth, Australia. Um, there he'll become the head of the Australian National Phenome Center. And as part of his new lab, he will include a seven Tesla MRMS system for the development of the LC free phenomics workflow. Uh, and from there, you can only imagine that this workflow could find adaptation uh, across the entire International Phenome Center network. Uh, and you can see here, I've listed the, the websites for several of those labs. Um, you know, so it's really exciting to, to see it be taken up into to this field right now. So, you know, Professor Nicholson was, you know, really pioneered the classical workflow, uh, is now hoping to help pioneer the LC free workflow, um, have other researchers move from the traditional workflow into the modern workflow. So what we can do now is go back to Professor Mueller, Remember, that was the metabolome mining approach that we saw earlier. He worked really closely with, with colleagues in Bruker to develop that. While developing all that workflow, uh, he was approached by our group to say, hey, you know, there might be a, a better way to do this. You know, and he was like, sure, you know, let's do it. But let's make it even harder. So now we have our wild type mix of bacteria, uh, but now we had more mutants. And so the idea was to go from the 20-minute LCQ TOF runs, 20 minutes per sample, uh, to a flow injection analysis, where we're going to go down to two minutes per sample. And again, we're going to have more higher throughput. So instead of just doing the wild type in the mutant variant, uh, we're going to add several mutants to the, to the experiment. So speed, you can see that you know going from 20 minutes down to two minutes is definitely going to improve speed for high throughput analysis. What about compound ID? And if you can remember, there was that peak at 506, that small compound that we found in, in the LCMS run. The goal was to see if we could find that doing the LC free MRMS workflow. And so that's what you can see here. We ran those runs. You know, it would just see a, a bunch of direct infusion spectra. You know, by eye, they almost all look the same. But statistically, they're well separated, you know, so it's easy to use statistics to do things that we can't do by eye. So the wild type and all of the mutants are, are easily separated. We can go to the scores and loading plots. And we can see if we look at the bucket for the 506 peak, that was that novel metabolite that they found earlier, we can easily see the knockout mutant is separated from the variants that had that metabolite. So the answer is yes. We can ID that. We could go into the mass spectrum. We could find that exact peak, um, and it's there. So we can do it statistically. We can look at the mass spec, and we can see it's there. 
And if we wanted to do the complementary NMR workflow, we could also do that to get the structure. Uh, in this case, it was just sort of a proof of principle to show that we could actually find it, which we did. Uh, and after that, they added the MRMS system to their traditional workhorse solutions. So, you know, all of these classical metabolomics groups are now sort of adding this as the high throughput fingerprint solution to their labs. So, to take the testing of this workflow even further, uh, a global ring trial is ongoing right now under the direction of Bruker uh, in collaboration with Professor Schmidt Koppelin at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. And the goals here were really twofold. Uh, first was to see if we have a method that is reproducible in labs, having various working knowledge of the LC-free methodology, sort of the, the phenome center methodology. You know, can any lab do this, or do you have to have specialty labs? Uh, and secondly, we want to see how sensitive this type of study is and what can be learned. Um, you know, is it as sensitive as we want it to be? So that being said, uh, we came up uh, with a set of samples. Uh, in this case, there was three samples, a human plasma, uh, a pesticide mix, and a, a spiked plasma, uh, all run at five different dilutions. Uh, and these, sent, these samples were sent to labs uh, across the globe. Uh, 16 labs worldwide, four different continents, and again, all with different fields of applications. These weren't all metabolomics labs. They could have been petroleumics labs or imaging labs or core facilities. Uh, it didn't really matter. The only condition was they had to have the MRMS. Uh, and all of these labs were kept anonymous. So nobody knows who was in the study. Nobody knows which results are which. Um, completely blind. So. 16 participants, uh, they got the three different sets of samples. The samples were run uh, at five different dilutions, all run in triplicates. The data was collected globally, uh, stored, uh, and then now we're in the process of doing the interlab comparison. Uh, the initial results were brought into Metabloscape, so Metabloscape was used for the initial screening of the data, for the bucketing, the feature finding, and all of that. And all of the advanced statistical analysis was done uh, with home-built software from Professor Schmidt Kaplin's group, who did all of the analysis for this. So what did we learn? Well, of the 16 labs, we had 11 provide results. Um, you know, some of them just weren't able to respond. Of those 11, uh, nine groups had great data, which is shown here. So only two groups really uh, provided data that, that wasn't able to be used. Um, and so to get the best snapshot of the overall ring trial uh, is done by looking at the, the sample that was the plasma spiked with pesticides. So in this case, the plasma was diluted uh, 1 to 50 uh, as the stock solution. And then in that 1 to 50 dilution of the plasma sample, we spiked in different levels of pesticides. And it was a, a commercial pesticide mix that had 85 pesticides. Uh, and you can see we recovered 69 of those pesticides in the positive mode mass spectra. Uh, the other 16 that weren't recovered could only be detected in negative ion mode. And that data is just not shown here, but we do have it. If you look to the right here of the slide, um, you can see the, the sensitivity for these pesticides. Again, this is pesticides within the plasma matrix. Um, and if we look at the 20 ppb level, 88%, uh, almost 90% of the pesticides were detected across all labs. So that that's very good reproducibility. Uh, if we go from 20 ppb all the way down to one part per billion, uh, at one ppb, we actually get 76% of the pesticides detected across all labs. Uh, again, that's using a, a pairwise calculation to get better statistics. So very good reproducibility. Um, very good sensitivity. Um, and then what else could we determine? Because it was the plasma, we wanted to look at the plasma metabolites. So what we did is we searched that against the databases. In this case, it was the HMDB database. And we got almost 400 annotations there. 68% um, of those annotations had the full isotope pattern used to confirm. Uh, and only 32% were confirmed by exact mass. So good sensitivity, good matching against the database. What's really interesting, though, is that there was almost 4,000 
other features identified using Metabolscape, right? So that's really what's under investigation in Professor Smith Coupling's lab now. You know, 400 database matches is good. That's kind of what you're going to get in the QTOF. So we have the same coverage against the databases. We have the increased throughput going from 20 minutes down to two minutes. But what we also get are these additional almost 4,000 peaks. Half of those 4,000 peaks were confirmed with their isotope patterns, uh, and the other half, or just under half, were confirmed by exact mass. Once we have an understanding of these you know, 3,700 peaks, the coverage that we are going to get is just going to skyrocket. So we have the speed, we have the sensitivity, and hopefully soon, once we're finished going through all of this data, will have a much, much better coverage of the metabolome. It's just no one's been doing this, and so we don't have database or reference materials to go through, uh, so it's just a lot of work. But the, the group in Munich uh, is really pushing for that, and hopefully we'll have results for this by the end of the year. So the role of MRMS within metabolomics really has uh, unlimited potential for growth. Um, if we go back to, say, 1998, uh, when metabolomics was coined, and, and look at publications over time, uh, there was a proof of principle article uh, back in 2001 uh, by Alan Marshall and Cooper that you know really kicked it all off. You know there were some others at the time, uh, but really in 2005 is when MRMS publications in the metabolomics field sort of started to take off. Uh, and what you can see it followed the same trend as mass spec in metabolomics. So the, the blue boxes are, are the mass spec publications in the field of metabolomics. And you can see last year they had almost 13,000 publications. Uh, and then the red line is, is the role of MRMS in metabolomics. And again, you can see it's the same trend, you know, increasing over time. Um, but it's much fewer, right? So about 800 publications. So that there's really, you know, Lots and lots of room for growth for, for this application. So earlier in the talk, what we did is we talked about how the detector really is what separates MRMS from the rest of the field. And it's this extreme resolving power that allows us to go LC-free. Well, what happens is you're going to see lots of graphs out there where they try to show very specific examples where other systems may perform just as good. But what they're really doing is they're limiting themselves to these small regions that you see here. Um, you know, so you have low-resolution instruments, medium-resolution instruments, some sort of high or sort of high-resolution instruments. And whenever they show specs, what they do is they show it within that little box, right? But what they forget to mention or what they don't mention or what they don't want to mention is that when they do those comparisons, it doesn't really apply directly to MRMS. It applies under some fixed conditions, but MRMS, we can always go beyond. Right? We can simply increase our mass resolving power. So if we're in the range where it's the, the QTOS or something like that, where they show that they can do better than the MRMS systems, under those given conditions, it might be true. But they're fixed, and those are best case conditions for those guys. What they don't tell you is that we can simply increase our resolving power and go beyond that. Right. So we always have the ability to go one step beyond. Right? So you could play all of these games and show all of these charts, but the important thing to take away from here is that if you look outside where the things that only MRMS can resolve, um, nothing else can cover what it can cover. And it can go all the way down to small molecules, all the way up to high molecular weight species, uh, and really surpass anything else. So why not settle for one of those in-between ones? Well, it's really because you know, not all resolving power is the same, right? You know, this is why they can't really follow MRMS anyways. Um, so the LC free workflow relies on extreme resolving power. Uh, and these non MRMS platforms that do claim high resolving power really suffer some drastic drawbacks. Um, and that's why they can't really be used for these LC free workflows. Um, three of the main ones you, you can see here, the first being are my peaks real? And, and what happens in these other platforms is peaks that look like they're high resolution, you know, and might show a really big number for resolving power aren't real. You know, that one peak that they're showing of high resolving power is actually 
two peaks that coalesced into a single peak. So not only is the resolving power wrong, the information is wrong because it's not one peak, it's actually two peaks, right? So, you know, it's not coalescence or it's not anything else, it's just simply wrong data. To avoid that, what they do is they limit the number of ions that go into the detector, right? By limiting the number of ions that go into the detector, what happens is, is you don't see everything. So you limit the dynamic range. So now when you're looking for those small peaks like we saw earlier, that C506 peak, you might lose that because now you've limited the number of ions and you can't see it. So what happens is, is they try to balance. Um, they don't overfill, they don't underfill. They sort of fill in the middle. And what happens there is that they suffer from mass accuracy. So now when you're trying to do high mass accuracy stuff for compound ID, you don't even have that. So, so there's some major drawbacks that these other systems suffer from. Does MRMS suffer from them? Well, yes and no. Um, the important thing to listen to or to remember is that the longer you listen on MRMS, the more you hear, right? And all other mass specs have an upper limit to resolving power. Um, why? Do we not suffer from those same drawbacks? Well, we have a much, much larger detection volume. So MRMS has a huge detection cell that can really handle the complexity of, of these complex mixtures. Uh, and the idea of coalescence or mass accuracy or dynamic range are really digital versus analog. Um, in the MRMS, you can go all the way, you know, you can fill, you can fill, you can fill, think of like a cup of water. You can fill the water all the way up to the top and it still holds the water and everything's just as good until you can't fill it any no more, right? So that's sort of this digital behavior where it works perfectly until it doesn't. All of these other ones suffer from artifacts from the second you put just a few too many ions in, right? So you might not even get halfway full before you start suffering these ill effects. So you don't really know when you can start believing your data. You know, and so, so that's how you know, we really distinguish ourselves from these other systems. So that being said, um, now that we can generate all of this really rich, complex data really quickly, really sensitively, uh, we come to our software package. And, and again, as in our traditional workhorse solutions, we use Metabolscape 4.0, our complete data analysis package. Um, the data in this case is acquired on the MRMS system. Uh, and then it's deconvoluted using the T-Rex 2D feature finder. The importance of this and really a lot of the power in Metabolscape is the idea where we take all of these isotopes and all of these isotopes may have addicts, sodium addicts, two sodium addicts, which would give you redundant information in your statistics. It might have 15, 20 peaks that relate to a single molecular formula and you don't want that because those are just redundant information. So what the T-Rex 2D does is it takes all of those isotopes and all of those adducts and bins them into a single feature. So now you have one feature that contains all of the isotopic information, all of the adducts, and now when you do statistics, you do statistics on just the one feature and not all the adducts. So it greatly simplifies the software and the handling and makes everything just much cleaner. Once we have all of this information deconvoluted by T-Rex 2D, we can then easily do identification. Uh, we have these really nice annotation quality scoring icons that tell you how good or how bad your fit is. If everything's green, it's all good. If it's missing things, it indicates where it went wrong. Um, and from that, what we can do is we can do use databases, which are analyte lists or smart formula, or many of these other different things that might be more applicable to the TOF workflow. Uh, but again, smart formula is going to include isotopic fine structure when available. It's going to include true isotope pattern. And when it has to rely on pure mass accuracy, it will rely on pure mass accuracy. So it's really a three-tiered approach uh, to identification. Uh, and once we've ID'd all of this stuff, we can quickly do statistics. We can find our outliers. We can find our biomarkers. We can find anything interesting uh, with very little effort. We know what it is, and we can move on. Uh, and we also have pathway mapping. So if you knew what your pathway is and you're trying to target some of this stuff, we can easily do that too. Just to highlight a couple of the quick features here, um, MRMS, uh, here we show Metabolscape looking at, at 560 samples at once. So in the study that we were doing here, um, we just had 560 data sets that were all brought into Metabolscape. So you can see you can handle uh, the demands of high throughput. Uh, again, it applies all of the same features. 
Uh, and if you look over here to the right, you can see all of the isotopic fine structure. So if we have that, we can utilize all that. It gives us the molecular formulas directly. Um, just another bonus to, to moving to this workflow. Again, even in this version in Metabolscape 4.0, you can quickly identify which peaks are ID'd with isotopic fine structure. So kind of going beyond this annotation, quality scoring, to, to really highlighting where we do have isotopic fine structure. Uh, and then in the end, this is our solution, MRMS Accelerate. So it, it combines the, the MRMS, and in this case, the CIMAX platform with Metabolscape to do the TRX 2D feature extraction, smart formula statistical analysis, um, and everything that we've just gone through. What this does is it accelerates throughput. You know, we can easily run 200 samples per day. It's complementary to established NMR-based solutions. We get simultaneous analysis of known and unknown metabolites, so targeted and untargeted. Uh, it's really important that we access compounds not readily detectable by LCMS analysis, so we're not bound to the chemistries of those columns. We can actually see whatever is in the sample. And again, if we have a two-minute run, we can do two-minute run in positive mode. We can do a two-minute run in negative mode. So less than five minutes, we get both positive and negative of any given sample. Uh, and then we have the three-tiered confidence identification. Just for some quick clarification, MRMS technology uh, is out this year in 2018. And, and really what it is, it's the modern uh, incarnation, let's say, of the classical FTICRMS. So FTICRMS uh, you know, was invented in 1973. Uh, it was commercially marketed by Bruker as FTMS back in the 80s. And sort of the modern generation of, of MRMS was the Celeric series in 2009, uh, with really big improvements in 2013 and 2016, with really this huge next generation step in 2018 and this year, uh, where CIMAX uh, defines the next generation of FTMS as magnetic resonance mass spectrometry, MRMS. Here's the technology behind it. So the Maxwell magnet, if we look to the right, uh, it's a seven Tesla magnet with an ultra stable field. It's very, very small. Um, we brought them to all of our conferences, the full size this year, really, really small stray field, but most importantly, no liquid nitrogen and no liquid helium fills are ever needed, ever. There's no liquid cryogens. Um, and that's just huge for people. Every two years, you'll have to exchange the cold line, uh, and no quench ducts are required because it doesn't quench. The refrigerated magnets we still provide, so we have the classical systems. But again, these are modern refrigerated magnets. These come in 7, 12, and 15 Tesla magnets, ultra-stable fields, compact design, small stray field. These also have no liquid nitrogen, so you don't have to do nitrogen fills on these magnets. These refrigerated magnets only get filled once a year, they have extended liquid helium hold time. So just once a year, you have to put a couple hundred liters of helium in it. Uh, and then every two years, you have to exchange the cold head. Um, just for some further reading, um, you don't have to take my word for all of this. Um, there's several really nice reviews over the last few years that promote this kind of workflow, a direct confusion aspect for phenotyping, you know, what does it really need to perform, you know, non-targeted fingerprinting, um, all of the stuff that, that we tried to address today, you know, they ask these questions and try to address them in these reviews. So really nice resources for you there. We also have poster halls and application notes um, through our collaborators. Uh, the, the poster halls are really nice just to give you an overview of what researchers in the fields are doing. And uh, those can be found at the, the Bruker website. Uh, just a couple of final thoughts, um, really addressing concerns and next steps. Uh, MRS Accelerate, MRMS Accelerate, is a non-targeted first-pass method. Um, it does not have to be quantitative. It doesn't have to separate isobars or really find every single metabolite. What it really is is a fingerprint. We see it's really sensitive, uh, it's really quick, and it's really unique. So with the high complexity of these samples, we get a really unique fingerprint for each one. So that's why we don't have to be exhaustive, right? You get a unique fingerprint. You get the high throughput, you can do your statistics, it gets you all the information you need to quickly move on. If required, you can always do follow-up experiments, right? You could do an LC-MS-MS run after that if you wanted to target something, or you could do a GC-MS run, or you could do an LC-HI-RES for quantitation, right? So if you really had to dig a little bit deeper, you can always then go to one of these other workhorse solutions that most labs also have uh, 
to follow up. And the other thing is iron suppression. Um, iron suppression is always a concern, um, but all of these people are using it and, and it's been addressed lots of times. Here's just a, an example from a nice publication uh, in 2017, direct infusion mass spectrometry for metabolomic phenotyping of disease. Um, I, I won't read through the whole quote, but you know, at the very end it says, you know, there is no evidence that this detrimental effect is more problematic in fingerprinting tools than in hyphenated approaches. So you're always going to suffer ion suppression, but it's no different from the direct infusion workflow than it is from the LCMS workflow. So with that, I would like to thank you for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Excellent information and collection of data. Uh, we are now going to take any questions that you may have, and as a reminder to everyone, if you could please use the Q&A box and direct your questions to all participants. I know there were several questions coming in as you were speaking, so some of these you may have already answered, but um, I'll go ahead and ask them anyway. Uh, how many samples can be run in a day? Good question. So with a runtime of around two minutes, um, you can easily run more than 200 samples in a single day. Okay, great. Um, is isotopic fine structure observed for a selected mass range? No, no, we're not limited to a selected mass range at all. Um, isotopic fine structure can really be observed over the entire mass range. So one of those slides, I, I tried to highlight the fact that we could see it from the very small molecules all the way out to the to the large molecules. Typically, for these experiments, we run from you know 100 to 1,000 mass to charge, and we can easily resolve all of those peaks and observe isotopic fine structure. Uh, beyond that, maybe not so much, but the MRS does have a, a mass range that extends out to, to 10,000 uh, m over z. So, so we can push it really far if we have to. Okay. I know you did answer some question, or you had some information about the software, but someone's asking, can Metabascape handle LCMRMS data? Uh, yeah. So it, it's not a workflow that we, we try to promote, but, you know, again, if you wanted to follow up on one of those secondary methods to try to do quantitation or try to do MSMS, yes, Metabascape 4.0 can handle both LCMRMS data and DI direct infusion MRMS data, as well as all of the LCTOF data that Bruker has. I know it was real interesting about the cryogen. Somebody also is asking, uh, does Cymax really require no liquid cryogens? Yeah, believe it or not, that's correct. Um, you know, this really blows people away. Um, Cymax uses the Maxwell Magnet technologies, and, and there really is no liquid cryogen fills ever required. Okay, wow. What yeah. was the original dilution factor for plasma samples? Another question. The, so the plasmas, um, the dilution factors for the plasma that we used in the ring trial uh, were typically found to be best around 1 to 50 or 1 to 100. Okay, thank you. Another question here. Can the workflow be automated or is it direct injection only? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, you could do it however you want. So in the ring trial, everybody did it by direct injection, just because not everybody had the same type of automation on the front end. Uh, but this workflow is easily automated if you have the right sample handling. Okay, just a couple more questions then as we have a few more minutes here. Are you acquiring MS, MS data or is it MS only? Uh, the initial run is MS only, um, and again, uh, we, we're going to do our identifications with isotopic fine structure, true isotope patterns, or mass accuracy. So initially, we don't need MSMS for identification. However, if MSMS is required, uh, you could do a, a follow-up run using MSMS. Okay, I've got time for one more question here. What about quantitation? Uh, so another good question. Relative quantitation works really well. Uh, within the MRMS Accelerate workflow. Um, everyone really likes to do that. However, if absolute quantitation is required for a specific compound, again, you know, as I tried to stress, uh, you can just follow up the, the initial fingerprinting run with, with a secondary method. 
Okay, we covered a lot of information here, and unfortunately we are running out of time, but if we did not get to one of your questions, certainly feel free to contact uh, Dr. Thompson at Christopher, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R, dot Thompson at Bruker.com. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great information that was covered here, and I'm certainly sure he can share more with you if you are interested in obtaining more information. With that, we thank everyone for joining us this afternoon, and you can certainly visit the Bruker website, as Chris mentioned, for more information at www.bruker.com.